meridian here and see what happens when we stimulate this one acupuncture point. Uh, this is not to scale, but the time is to scale. So what happens is that I'm going to stimulate this acupuncture point. Here's what the acupuncture points, acupuncture points look like along the meridian. You can see they're of different sizes. And I'm going to stimulate this particular acupuncture point down here. And uh, let's see what happens. Okay, we've stimulated that acupuncture point. And now the information of that stimulation is moving on meridian and now stimulates this acupuncture point. The information continues to move along the meridian. It's moving actually about five to 10 centimeters per second. It's a very slow moving signal along the meridian, continues on, this point's a little further along. And now this acupuncture point is even further away along the same meridian. Takes it a little bit longer to get there. The, the time here is correct though. And eventually it gets stimulated as well. So we've produced real-time images of acupuncture points during stimulation, although the data is collected in real time, produce the images that you see later. When stimulated, the acupuncture twists itself around the needle. The stimulation process is communicated to other acupoints along the same meridian. It speeds, depends upon the individual, but it goes from five to 10 centimeters per second. It turns out that a number of the subjects that we've used are very, very sensitive to this process of the flow of chi, and their description of the flow of chi up their leg of energy is precisely what we measure and the rate that we measure. Um, obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but the mechanisms or the nature of the communication process is certainly unknown. It's something we are trying to investigate at this point in time. Now, we're using fMRI to produce uh, signals from acupuncture stimulation. And as I indicated earlier, the classical fMRI study is to look at the time between flashing lights and brain activity, which takes about 180, 200 milliseconds. But let's, let's use ultrasound to actually stimulate the acupuncture point because it allows us to make precise measurements of time between stimulation and brain activity. It turns out that when you do this and you begin looking at what happens in the visual cortex of the brain, you see a signal that appears to be there almost instantaneously, less than or equal to about eight-tenths of a millisecond. This is actually two orders of magnitude faster than any known process, which actually drives my neuroscience colleagues absolutely nuts. But if it turns out if you stimulate an acupuncture point, uh, you stimulate a region that's not an acupuncture point, you don't see this. When you stimulate the acupuncture point, you see it. Stimulate a non-acupuncture point, you don't see it. Stimulate the acupuncture point, you do. So you tell me, what's the problem? Um, and hopefully someone can also explain what's going on. Uh, it's certainly consistent with uh, subtle energy fields, or perhaps the acupuncture point is generating a pulse of electromagnetic energy that's picked up by an acupuncture point in the brain. The, uh, uh, the process is, is still very, very much under study and investigation. Uh, well, we've sort of delineated three different pathways by which the signals of stimulation actually get to the brain. There's this very, very fast signal, could be instantaneous. There is uh, activity that you see in the visual cortex about 180, 200 milliseconds later. This is clearly along a nerve pathway. And then there's this very slow signal that moves along the meridians, taking many seconds to get to the, to the brain center. So what you see in an fMRI image is an initial pulse of activity, then uh, additional activity at this time frame, and then much later additional activities. Uh, our studies of acupuncture are still in a very early stage. There are many challenging and fundamental problems remain to be solved. However, I really do think that the results could potentially fundamentally change not only the practice of medicine, the delivery of healthcare system, but we may also shake up the standard scientific paradigm just a little bit. Thank you very much. How exciting. I promised this lady from the last session. Hi, I'm Marcia Sims, and this is a question left over from your last session. I'm okay. sorry, but okay. I'm really interested in your use of um, cleaning the laboratories and the healing and the house cleaning with colors and would like to know more about that. Um, are there specific uh, 
reasons why certain colors might be selected and what would their effects be? And is there a certain color that's shown in a dirty lab versus a clean lab? Well, uh, there, are, there, are a number, there are a number of books. About, uh, you know, I, I'm, I have amateur status as a pranic healer, so, or, or as a healer in general. But um, uh, there are a number of books available on, on, uh, on healing and in pranic healing in particular. Uh, in fact, there's a marvelous book called Your Hands Can Heal You that's uh, written by Stephen Coe. Uh, that's, uh, I think, it's quite a wonderful book. And it turns out we have a superb pranic healer with us today that I didn't know was going to be here, Mary Clark. And uh, you, why don't you, you can chat with her later because uh, she knows about everything about pranic healing that one should ever know. How did I set you up? Okay. <laughs> And uh, she lives in San Diego. I'll put in a plug for you. Uh, she's, in, she's in San Diego, and she, uh, she actually does pranic healing in her practice and uh, uh, is uh, quite active in the pranic healing community and uh, is also a very nice person. So, <laughs> Joy Carl Medwedeff, I have a question regarding yes. the stimulation of the acupuncture point where yes. you... Um, the uh, ones further down, the meridian, uh, adopted the same shape. Did they seem to be aligned on a like a north-south axis. Is is that the alignment type of thing you? No, were? no, no. The, this no, was I, merely. I, I meant that metaphorically, the north-south, but I mean, in a way that one could describe as north-south. It was. No, the the acupuncture points. The top of the acupuncture points were facing the skin. So if you come up the leg, they're all sort of facing in the same direction up the leg. Okay. Hi. Um. No, no, I, I don't know. That's the, way, that's the way they are. I, you know, what makes them that way, I'm not sure. Mike Wilson, how long does uh, the acupuncture stay stimulated after it's been stimulated? Uh, I wish I had a good answer for you that. It depends on the level of stimulation you do. Uh, uh, if you continually stimulate the acupuncture points, they seem to be stimulated for a longer period of time. But quite honestly, that's not something that we've really looked at carefully. We have some sort of anecdotal data on that, but uh, I, I really wouldn't be able to answer the question very carefully. I'm uh, Daryl Laham. Um, absolutely amazing work. These last three talks have just blown me away. The question oh. I have is uh, what this tells us, uh, obviously, about replicability in other labs, especially hostile labs toward the psi um, condition. But I noticed earlier that you're, that you're um, you. publishing in um, sort of uh, uh, preaching to the choir publications, and we want to change the standard scientific paradigm. I'm wondering, with the quality of these studies that I've observed, um, where have you tried to publish, and what were their reasons for, for not publishing? <laughs> well, that's an interesting story. Um, <laughs> Let, let, me, let me talk to you, let me, let me mention, let's forget about pranic healing, that's just too weird. But let's talk about the acupuncture study, okay? When we did this acupuncture study, the initial one back in 96, 97, with the images, it was, it was the first study that had ever been done where, uh, that showed a direct relationship between the stimulation of an acupuncture point and activity in the, in the brain. And I had already pre-selected the images that I knew were going to be on the, first co on the front cover of science. And, you know, and so we wrote this paper for science. We submitted it. Uh, we didn't even get a response. And finally, after a while, we called the, uh, the editor in Washington, and uh, one, of the, one of the staff members basically said, oh, you submitted that paper. We don't review that sort of stuff. So we couldn't even get a review. All right, now, the story goes on. We then submitted the manuscript to Nature. And now, there are three editors of Nature. There's one in London, there's one in Washington, there's one in Tokyo. So we thought, well, we might have a better response if we submitted this to Tokyo. We did. And the editor in Tokyo did actually read the paper and thought it was interesting, but was extremely uncomfortable about publishing this. Uh, he decided that he would consider it if we could get uh, a, a number of outside reviewers of our choice that would write letters about it. Uh, we had five Nobel Prize winners in the neurosciences that wrote five rave letters about the manuscript, and he still decided that it, he just couldn't publish this in Nature. Uh, 
all five of the members, the Nobel Prize winners, were also members of the National Academy, and to get a paper published in